Um, so look at uh, Genesis 47 verse, uh, let me just find my place there. All right, Genesis 47 verse 15, the Bible reads, And when money failed in the land of Egypt and in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Pharaoh and said, <clears throat> Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. The title for the sermon this morning is, The Money Faileth. You know, brethren, there's going to come a time where your money just fails you. You know, I mean, it's, it's a tool that you use, you know, to, to purchase your goods and your services. But there are too many men, there are too many people, and we're driven by society, by the programming in this world, it's to think that money is the most important thing of this world. You know, the Bible warns us that the love of money is the root of, of evil. And so money will fail you. I mean, it, it can serve its purpose for this life, but when things get desperate, when things matter about, you know, saving your life or even eternity, your money will fail. So let's start off here in verse number 1, Genesis 47, verse 1. And uh, the family of Joseph is being presented before Pharaoh. It says, And then Joseph came and told Pharaoh and said, My father and my brethren and their flocks and their herds and all that they have are come out of the land of Canaan. And behold, they are in the land of Goshen. And he took some of his brethren, even five men. I'm not sure why he took five. I'm not sure why he didn't take all his brethren. But he takes a portion of them and presented them unto Pharaoh. And Pharaoh said unto his brethren, What is your occupation? And they said unto Pharaoh, Thy servants are shepherds, both we and also our fathers. You may recall from the previous chapter that Joseph told them that shepherds are an abomination to the Egyptians. So what they're saying to Pharaoh here. Basically, yeah, we're an abomination to you, okay? And, and, and that they want to stay in the land of Goshen. You know, they don't, they don't want to be where, where the majority of the Egyptians are. They don't want to be, you know, stuck in a major city. They looked for the lands where they could have their herds. And the benefit of being an abomination is that they would be left alone. That, that was the benefit. They'd be left alone there in the land of Goshen. And you'll soon see that Pharaoh, yep, you know, he agrees to, to leave them on that land. And uh, it says here in verse number 4, and, more, and, and said moreover unto Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the land are we come, for thy servants have no pasture for their flocks, for the famine is saw in the land of Canaan. Now therefore we pray thee, let thy servants dwell in the land of Goshen. What I want you to notice there in the beginning of verse number 4, it says, They moreover said unto Pharaoh, For to sojourn in the land are we come. You know, they make it very clear, Pharaoh, we haven't come to Egypt to reside here indefinitely. You know, we're not here to take all your land, to take all your possessions. We're not here to, to you know, uh, you know uh, what's the word I'm looking for? To infiltrate your, your nation. We're here as sojourners only. And that was important for them to make that known. You know, because the Bible is very clear about how, you know, Egypt is, as we read about Egypt in the Bible, it represents the world. It represents this ungodly world that's here, brethren. And, and our hearts and our desires shouldn't be to make this our, our, our permanent dwelling place. You know, our, our hearts, our minds ought to be on eternity, ought to be on heaven. And the way we look at ourselves on this earth is to look at ourselves as sojourners, just passing by. You know, we're here to accomplish a task that God has left us to do. You know, we're here to, to be about the Father's business, but we're not here to be about our own business. You know, our business ought to be the Father's business. God has put us on this earth for a purpose. Keep your finger there and go to John 17. Go to John 17. I've got many passages in the Bible that are my favorites. John 17 is one of my favorites. John 17, 14. John 17, 14. You know, we're on this earth because of a necessity, brethren. We're here, you know, when we got saved... When, when God washed us from our sins, when we were made children of God, He did not take us to heaven immediately, did He? He left us here. He left us here for a purpose. He didn't leave us here to seek the riches of this world. Why? Because money will fail you. That's not what we're about, brethren. That is what this world is about, yes. But that ought not to be what we're about. John 17, 14, Jesus praying to the Father, you know, getting ready for His departure. He prays to the Father and says these words, I have given them thy word. 
speaking about his disciples, speaking about the believers. And I want you to think about not necessarily the disciples, the 12 disciples and, and the, you know, the 120 in the upper room. No, I want you to think about this prayer about yourself. And it is for you. It is a prayer that Jesus makes on your behalf. Jesus says, He's given thy word. You know, your Bibles that you're holding in your hands have been given to you by Jesus. And it says here, And the world have hated them because they are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Think about that. Was Jesus of this world? No. He came from heaven. He came from above. And he says, in the same way that I am not of this world, neither are they. Neither are you. You say, but I was born here. Yes, but now that you're saved, you're not of this world anymore. You're just like Jesus. You're just passing through. Your destination is heaven. Your home is heaven. This is why you know, the Bible tells us that we're ambassadors for Christ. We're ambassadors. We're not from Australia. We're not from earth. We're from heaven. We represent the kingdom of God. We're His children. You know what that means? That means while you're on this earth, you ought to represent Christ. You ought to represent heaven. That's what you're ambassador of. You know, you've been given a job there to represent heaven. And then look at verse number 15. I pray not that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest keep them from the evil. Okay, so now you know what God wants us here on this earth. He doesn't want us taken out of this earth, of, of this world just yet, but He wants us to protect us from evil, protect us from living a sinful life, protect us from the evil one, protect us from just being like the world. Verse number 16, They are not of the world, even as I am not of the world. Sanctify them through thy truth. Thy word is truth. So what do we learn there? Jesus already told us that He's given us His Word, and now He wants us to be sanctified. He wants us to be cleansed. He wants us to, to be walking in accordance to the way of His Word, not in the way of this world, but by the way of His Word. His Word, thy Word is truth. Verse number 18, As thou hast sent me into the world, even so have I also sent them into the world. You probably didn't notice that, brethren. Now, it's obvious we know that God the Father sent the Son. That's obvious. We know He came on a mission to die on the cross to give us forgiveness through His sacrifice. In the same way that the Father has sent the Son, now that you're saved, you're being sent by Jesus. You're on a mission. You've got a job to do. Jesus is counting on you to do the job. He's sending you. He thinks you're worthy of this calling. You may not feel yourself worthy, but you are, according to Jesus. He sent you for a job. And what is that? Verse number 19. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself, that they might also be sanctified through the truth. Neither pray I for these alone, not just those disciples that he had, but for them also, which shall believe on me through their word. That's you. Okay, because of the disciples, because of the apostles, passing down the gospel, you now have believed on the word, so Jesus is praying for you also. Verse number 21, that they all may be one, as thou, Father, art in me, and I in thee. Look at this. That they also may be one in us, that the world may believe that thou hast sent me. Hey, what are you being sent to do, brethren? What is your job as an ambassador for Christ? It's to cause this world to believe on Jesus Christ. That's your job. You say, what is it? What's the will of God in my life? It's to win the lost. It's to preach the gospel. It's to be an ambassador for Jesus, to get people saved. That's what you're called to do. That's your job, right? But you say, but I've got my nine to five job. Yeah, all of that is ultimately to, to facilitate your ability to preach the gospel or to facilitate other people, you know, to do the works of God that he sent us to do. You know, everything, brethren, that we do, yes, we need to live. Yes, we need to work. Yes, we need to have relationships. Yes, we need to get married, have kids, go to church. You know, we need to interact with this world. I understand. Go to the shops. All of it is for the purpose that Jesus Christ has sent us to do, to see this world saved. Did you know that? That's your purpose. That's why you're saved. That's why you're still here on this earth. We're just sojourners, brethren. We're not here to make our permanent abode on this earth to amass as many riches as we can, know our purpose is to preach the gospel. I want you to think about that then. If that's the truth, which is, it is the truth. If that's the truth, how well does your life line up to that truth? How well does it line up? Or is it really just trying to get the most out of this world? Just please yourself. 
just seeking the pleasures of this world, or are you truly seeking to be someone that is already sent by Jesus to do the work that Jesus has sent you to do? You know, what if you were an employer and you sent your employee to do a job? You know, and I, I'm giving you two weeks to accomplish this project. At the end of the two weeks, your employee comes up to you, oh, I didn't do it. Say, what were you up to? Oh, I went bowling, I went fishing, you know, I went camping. I mean, wouldn't you just be angry? Wouldn't you just be upset at that employee? Wouldn't you be frustrated at that employee? I mean, you might even fire them, all right? for being such, for being so lazy. Well, Jesus has given you a job. Jesus is sending you. I don't want Jesus to be frustrated at you. I don't want Jesus to be angry at you. And all you need to do, brethren, is open your mouth boldly and proclaim the gospel. And you're doing the work that Jesus has asked you to do. Let's go back to Genesis 47, please. Genesis 47, verse 5. Genesis 47, verse 5. And Pharaoh spake unto Joseph, saying... Thy father and thy brethren are come unto thee. The land of Egypt is before thee. In the best of the land, make thy father and brethren to dwell. In the land of Goshen, let them dwell. If thou knowest any man of activity among them, then make them rulers over my cattle. And Joseph brought in Jacob his father and set him before Pharaoh. And lo- notice the next words. This was the memory verse of the word. In verse number 10, it gets repeated. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh. Is that a bit odd to you? Pharaoh, who is an ungodly authority in Egypt, number one in charge of Egypt, he's not saved. He's not, a, he's not a Christian. He's not a godly man. He has his false gods. He's got his false priests. You'll read about the priests later on. But Jacob comes and he, he blesses Pharaoh, you know. And uh, so Jacob blesses a powerful yet ungodly man. And I believe this is, you know, we're passing through this world, like I said, right? And I believe this is just an example of how we ought to deal with this world. You know, we're dealing with ungodly people all the time in your workplace, in, in the interactions, you know, that you go about, you know, your life. My kids play soccer with some other kids, you know. They're not saved. Those families aren't saved. But you still got to interact with this world, right? You can't close your, yourself up in a bubble and say, well, I'll have nothing to do with the ungodly. And yet Jacob here is brought before Pharaoh and he blesses Pharaoh. You know, he wishes him well. I don't know exactly how he blesses him. He doesn't really tell us. I don't know if he brings him a gift. You know, but at the end of it, Pharaoh can say, well, my interaction with Jacob was a blessing. I got something out of it. It was profitable. I'm glad I met Jacob. He's in the mind of Pharaoh. He's been blessed by Jacob. You know, and brethren, you know, we ought to be Christians, you know, sons of God. Yes, we, we, we have our convictions. Yes, we have the doctrines by which we stand. Yes, you know, we are not to be like this world. You know, yes, we're not to support the ungodly practices in this world. But your goal also when you interact with the ungodly is to be a blessing. Is to be profitable for them. Is that they can meet you and say, well, this person's not a jerk. Okay, I, I thought he was a jerk because of the things he believes. I thought he was a jerk because of the doctrines that he stands on. But when I meet him, he's a blessing. When I meet him, he's a good guy. He's a good woman. You know, she's a good woman. That's how we ought to interact in this world where people meet you and they're glad to have met you. Not just be a jerk, all right? And look, if the things you believe cause you to, for them to think that way, great. But listen, when they meet you, don't be that jerk. Just say, hey, you're like Pharaoh. You're ungodly, all right? But you're someone I have to interact with. You're someone I have to deal with. And if, you, if I can bless you, if I can profit you somehow, this might open the door for the mission that we're left to do which is to preach the gospel. I mean, if they don't like you, if they think you're an idiot, if they think you're just just that jerk, you think they want to to hear the gospel from your mouth? No, they've got to like you, right? The the people you meet, your unsafe family, members, they're going to say, well, you know, yeah, okay, he's got some weird beliefs, but he's a likable person. You know, I actually enjoy being around his company. That's how we do the job that God has left us to do, right? We be a blessing to other people. Notice as well in verse number 6, you know, uh, Pharaoh, uh, basically, second half of it says, and if thou knowest any man of activity among them, that's your brothers, you know, your family, then make them rulers over my cattle. You know what that means? Joseph was such a blessing to Pharaoh. Joseph had such a good reputation amongst the Egyptians. 
that for Pharaoh, it's like, well, if it's worth having Joseph, if this is how he was raised and brought up, and look at the quality of man that he is, then I'm sure his brothers are like that as well. And immediately he says, well, you guys can be the bosses. You guys can have promotions. You, can, you guys have a job available to you because of Joseph's example, right? Now, he doesn't know what his brothers are like. I mean, it looks like they're a bit of a mix, right? But because of Joseph, he was able to look at the other and say, well, I want them to be an authority. I want them to, to rule over, uh, to be rulers over my cattle, or it says there, right? I want them in positions of authority. And um, if you're a blessing to people, they're going to give you those opportunities. They're going to open the doors for you to do more things, to, to be a greater blessing, you know, to be put in positions of authority. And you know, this is where the argument comes. If you've been in the workplace, you know, you know what I'm talking about, especially in an office environment, where you know, there's that saying, it's, it's not what you know, but who you know. It's not what you know, but who you know. And it's usually used in a negative uh, connotation. So basically, let's say me and my colleague, you know, we're both trying to get that promotion, or we're try both trying to get that job, right? And I might have more skills. I might have been in the business longer. I might, I might know more, okay? But then my colleague gets along with all the managers, right? I mean, he's a likable fellow. Everyone kind of likes him. He may know less, you know, but he, he, he knows the people. And then he gets the promotion instead of me. And that's where people get frustrated. Oh, I see, it's not what you know, it's who you know. You know what, Brevin? It's both. <laughs> if, if you want opportunities available to you, if you want to succeed in this world, whatever opportunity that is, Brevin, it's, it's both. You've got to know what you're doing, and you've also got to, you know, get along with people. It's both. If you want to succeed in this world, you know, both elements are important. You know, I, I've used, I, I often use business examples because that's where I gain a lot of my experience, a lot of my knowledge. And I realize it, it sort of doesn't matter where it, where it applies. It applies in all aspects of this world. But I want you to think about this for a minute and think about how, you know, I was blessed with the opportunity to preach at the missions conference at Paperwood Baptist Church. I was blessed to be able to do that, right? Now, how did that come to be? Because think about it. I was sent and ordained by a man that is considered, to some extent, an enemy to that movement. How did that come to be, brethren? Was it the people, you know, is it, is it who I knew that got me there? In fact, the people that I knew would be the reason to not get me to preach at that conference, right? The people that sent me and ordained me would be the reason not to. I mean, that's quite a big risk, right? And when we started this church, you know, there was a push to some extent. That I, I felt anyway, maybe, maybe, maybe it's just me, but I, I felt there was a push to, well, we've got to be part of this movement. And for me, I was like, no, we're an independent church. We're an in and I'm glad we started that way. I'm glad we started this church in controversy, not our controversy, but within controversy, because then we could really drive home the importance for an independent church. Where I, I felt that, you know, you guys could respect me as your pastor, not because I'm part of some big movement or some, some worldwide thing, but you respected me as your pastor because I proved myself for that, right? That, that, I, that I did the hard yards, that I, that I served in my local churches, that I had the qualifications to be a pastor. And then that's how it started. You know, well, how did it start? With, with what we know. We, we started just doing what we know God wants us to do, to serve Him, to start churches, to preach the gospel, to preach the Bible without compromise. That's where we started, brethren. Okay? We started to do the things that we know we ought to do. And, you know... And then, in time, in due time, you know, organically, as things develop, then people see the work that we're doing here. People see the work that we started, the, the church that we planted down in Sydney. They see the work, our heart, our zeal for the Lord. Then those opportunities present themselves. Then you start meeting other people. And guess what? When you meet other people, you don't be a jerk about it. You be a blessing. It's both, brethren. It's what you know and who you know. And those that you know be a blessing. And then the opportunities come, right? And then I get to stand behind a big 500 whatever it was people, right? And preach a sermon, you know, at a conference. You know, that's how things go. That's how things develop, right? We do the things that are important here. The independent nature of this church. Doing what God has asked us to do. But it's, look, it's the same thing anywhere in your workplace, in your family, in your general life. It's what you know. Yes, that comes first. Work hard. Do what's called, what you're called to do. 
serve Christ. And then when you meet people, just be a blessing. Just be someone that people like, you know? Don't be the Facebook, anonymous Facebook. Well, I guess you're not really anonymous on Facebook. The anonymous YouTube, you know, commenters. Don't be that person. No one likes those people. Even when they're telling the truth. I don't like it how they're saying those things. Even when I agree with what they're saying. It's like, well, they're jerks. They'll never preach behind my pulpit. <laughs> okay? The ones that get to preach behind this pulpit are people that stand for the truth, that know what God has called them to do, but is a blessing as well. They're profitable as well. You know, we like them as well because we see their heart for the Lord. We see their heart for the lost. We see their heart for the things that are true. In Genesis 47, verse 8. Genesis 47, verse 8. And Pharaoh said unto Jacob, How old, how old art thou? And Jacob said unto Pharaoh, The days of the years of my pilgrimage are 130 years. Well, that's a lot. Imagine living 130 years. We'd say, man, that person's due to pass away, right? But then he says this, Few and evil have the days of the years of my life been, and have not attained unto the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their pilgrimage. He says, look, you know, what does he say there again? Uh, the days of, my, of the years of my pilgrimage. And he's the same, right? He's just, we're just sojourning. I'm just a pilgrim on this earth, and I've, I've, been, I've been on this pilgrimage now for 130 years, but it says that they're few. In comparison, not, not to us, but in comparison to his father and his grandfather, uh, Isaac lived 180 years, and Abraham lived 175 years, okay? And uh, Jacob's getting now toward the end of his life, okay? So it, he's right. You know, in comparison to his father and his grandfather, he hasn't lived as long. And he says, evil have the days of his years while life been. And we know because he suffered a lot, right? He suffered with, um, you know, being cheated many times by Laban, you know, his brother, the conflict that he had with his twin brother. And then, you know, the issues with his wife, how they were bickering amongst themselves about how many children they were having. And then we have him believing that he lost Joseph, you know, his favored son. So he has suffered a lot in these 100, 130 years that he's lived. And if you can keep your finger there, go to Hebrews 11 for me. Hebrews 11, verse 13. Hebrews 11, 13. And uh, just as a reminder here, and this is really important because we're, we're dealing with Old Testament saints. Okay, Old Testament saints. And I, I have talked about dispensationalism before, an uh, interpretive you know, tool that some Christians use to read their Bibles. And I, I reject it completely. I used to be non-dispensational, and I still am, but I've turned into anti-dispensational. Like, I'm actually against it now. I, I, I was non, like in my early 20s. When I got taught dispensationalism, I couldn't understand it. I couldn't find it in my Bible. And I said, well, it's not for me. Dispensationalism, yeah, if it helps brother so-and-so, if it helps pastor so-and-so, fine. It doesn't seem to help me at all. So I was non-dispensational. But the more I learn about it, the more I realize how deceptive it is, how, how it, it causes people to misunderstand the Scriptures, now I'm just completely anti, okay? Because according to dispensationalism, they, t they actually teach that the Jews or the Old Testament saints were actually seeking to live on this earth. That they were actually, you know, this physical earth, that's, that's their heart's desire. That's where God wants them for all eternity. You know, when God creates a new heaven and the new earth, they teach New Testament saints or the church, they, they will be in heaven. We will be in heaven according to them. But the Old Testament saints and the Jews, no, 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 they're going to remain on the new earth. And we're forever going to be separated. The New Testament saints in heaven, the Old Testament saints in, on the earth. But is that what we're seeing so far? They're just sojourners. They're, just, they're on a pilgrimage, right? And this is why when we turn to Hebrews 11, verse 13, Hebrews 11, verse 13, speaking about these Old Testament saints, it says, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. That's how they saw themselves, strangers and pilgrims. Verse 14, For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. Oh, that's Israel, that's, that's Jerusalem, right? We need to give the Jews the land because that's what they're seeking for. 
Verse 15, let's understand this. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had the opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country that is an heavenly. Wow, the Old Testament says they want to go to heaven. They want a heavenly country. Wow, Hebrews 11. Yeah, it destroys dispensationalism. Every chapter of the Bible destroys dispensationalism. All right? And heavenly, wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. We know that city is New Jerusalem. I'm telling you, dispensationalism says that new heavenly city, that's for the church, that's for the New Testament saints. But the Old Testament saints, they're just going to stay on the earth, like on the physical earth. But what are they looking for? The city. God has prepared for them a city. That's what Isaac's looking, uh, Jacob's looking forward to. That's why, you know, he's, he's just passing through, right? He's on his pilgrimage. He says, Abraham, Isaac, they were on a pilgrimage also. They were strangers also on this earth. Back to Genesis 47, verse 10. And Jacob blessed Pharaoh again and went out from before Pharaoh. So he blesses him when he meets him. He blesses him as he departs. I'm sure Pharaoh likes Jacob. Jacob's a likable guy, right? Jacob's trying to be friendly. He's thankful that Pharaoh is offering this land for them to stay. And he tries to get along with him as much as he can, even though the guy's an ungodly man. All right? Verse number 11. And Joseph placed his father and his brethren and gave them a possession in the land of Egypt, in the best of the land, in the land of uh, Ramesses, as Pharaoh had commanded. And Joseph nourished his father and his brethren and his father's household with bread according to their families. So remember, they're in the land of Canaan, they're in famine, they haven't got enough food. Now they're in the land of Egypt and Joseph is making sure they've got the best of everything. They've got the best lands, they've got the best food, they've got bread. It's important you soon see later because the Egyptians don't have bread. But these Israelites, these children of Israel, um, have bread, you know. And as I, as I was preparing for this sermon, I, I couldn't help but see some parallels with the end times. And maybe it's because I'm going through this end time series, it's all kind of in my mind. But as, as I was just looking at the rest of it, I'll, I'll share some of these things with you here. Uh, but, you know, the first thought that came to my mind is, how many years of famine was it again? Yeah, se- seven years of famine, right? How long is that final week that's coming up? It's a, it's a seven-year period, right? I mean, I'm not saying we can take everything from this story and apply it to the end time. I'm just saying there's, there's some interesting parallels, right? And they were going through two years of that famine where they were struggling. Well, they still had enough food, but they were struggling. They needed to purchase food. But then it got to a point where they were provided for. You know, instead of dying from hunger, instead of dying from starvation, God prepared something for them. You know, God prepared them wagons. God prepared them Joseph to be in the right place at the right time so they could go into Egypt and see out the rest of the hardship, see out the rest of the, the famine. And I couldn't help but think of that, you know, in the, in the same way. And I'll just read to you Luke 21, verse 17. You know, Jesus is speaking of the last days. And he says, And ye shall be hated of all men for my name's sake. And I thought about them, you know, the family of Joseph being shepherds, which are an abomination to the Egyptians, right? Being, being hated in a sense for their jobs, for their occupation. But in the last days, the Christians will be hated for the name of Jesus Christ. And then it says, Jesus says, But there shall not an hair of your head perish. In your patience possess ye your souls. What does Jesus promise the believers? That not a hair on your head will perish in the last days. But things are going, you know, there's turmoil, there's famine, there's pestilences, there's earthquakes. There's a whole lot of things going on at the beginning of that final seven year period. But Jesus says, look, if you just remain patient, you just possess your souls, you just stand strong, you just be faithful, God will make sure that no hair on your head will perish. You know, and I just couldn't, I could see that relationship there, that parallel that these, these Israelites would not perish even in a time of famine. Look at verse 14, Genesis 47, uh, 13, sorry, 13. And there was no bread in all the land. So that, you know, Joseph's family's having bread, but not the Egyptians. And it says, For the famine was very sore, so that the land of Egypt and all the land of Canaan fainted by reason of the famine. Now, I want you to notice this because there is famine in the last days. When it comes to that seven-year period, there is famine. Jesus Christ clearly uh, speaks of that. And what I want you to notice here is we see a pattern 
of how a nation collapses, okay? A pattern how, how, how money fails, you know, how it no longer holds the, the value of what it once held, you know, hyperinflation or lose it, or money just, just having no value anymore. You know, we see a pattern of these things. And, you know, we've seen this in history. We've seen where nations have crumbled, where kingdoms have crumbled, where, you know, if, you know, where, where money perishes, basically, where, where the economy fails, you know. And so we see a pattern of this in the Bible because the famine is grievous in the land of Egypt. Yes, Joseph did his best to make sure there was food, there was sufficient food, but we're coming at a time now where he has to be really careful with how he distributes the food, okay? Because there's still a lot of the famine left, and there's only a portion, there's only so much food left to go around. And then it says here in verse number 14, And Joseph gathered up all the money that was found in the land of Egypt. So basically, Joseph has all the money. You, you know, people's bank accounts are empty. You know, their, 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 their wallets are empty, right? It, it, they've tried to pay for the food. They've run out of money here. And in the land of Canaan, for the corn which they bought, and Joseph bought the money, or brought the money, sorry, into Pharaoh's house. So we see Pharaoh now just having all the money of Egypt, having all the wealth of the land of Canaan. Verse number 15, And when money failed in the land of Egypt, in the land of Canaan, all the Egyptians came unto Joseph and said, Give us bread, for why should we die in thy presence? For the money faileth. Brethren, you know what's more important than money? is food. Feeding yourself. You know when you're going hungry, when there's nothing on the shelves, there's nothing in the supermarkets, when there's no food, there's no flour, you're not going to care how big your bank account is. All you're going to care about is whether I can feed myself and whether I can feed my family. Brethren, you know what's more important than money? Your food, your daily bread. What does Jesus do when he prays to the Father, he gives the model prayer? Doesn't he pray for his daily bread? Isn't that more important to Jesus, your bread, your food, than how much money he had in the bank accounts? But brethren, how often do we pray to the Lord and we ask him to give us the finances? And we don't pray for the bread. Why? Because we live in a rich nation. We live in a nation, you just walk down the road, buy a loaf of bread and you're fine. And you don't appreciate the fact that you can do that, you know? But we need to learn to appreciate that we can even just do that, the, the, very, the, 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 the most minor thing to get bread, to buy eggs, you know, to buy milk, whatever it is, you know, all the ingredients to make yourself a meal, learn to appreciate even those small things. Because it doesn't matter how much money you have in the bank account. It's going to fail if you don't have food. It's going to fail when the world is going through hardships. All anybody's going to want to do is to have food. If you guys can keep your finger there, go to Revelation 6. Revelation 6, verse 5. It says here, this is one when, when the Lord is opening up the seals, uh, the seven seals. And it says here in verse number five, And we had opened the third seal. I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And behold, beh and I beheld, and lo, a black horse. And he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see, thou hurt not the oil and the wine. This is talking about that final seven-year period, brethren. You know what's going to happen? Famines. You know what's going to happen? Money will fail. You know, here we have a full day's job, a, a payment, which is a penny, roughly, in the Bible times. And all they can afford with a full day's labor is a bit of flour, a bit of wheat, right? Or just a measure of it. That's all. For a full day's labor, imagine having to feed a large family in these days. Are you concerned, Brother Kevin? You know, are you concerned that your family won't be fed if you're that last generation? Not really, because I have God. God's going to sort it out. Just like the Israelites when they were going through famine. God sorted it out. He had Joseph in Egypt. You know, he brought them wagons. He took them to the right place where they could, you know, provide for themselves. You know, and, you know, as we go through the end time series, and I know this is not, you know, the same series, but I want you to consider that if you go through fear, if it starts to, if, if the words of the Bible starts to give you fear about this time, just remember, you've got God on your side. You know, the, the children of Israel, they had Joseph on their side. We've got someone greater than Joseph. We've got Jesus Christ. We've got God on our side. He's going to look after. He's not going to allow a hair of our head 
to perish. What else does it say there in verse number, oh no, sorry, please go to Matthew 6, please, Matthew chapter 6, Matthew chapter 6. You know, the money we hold in our hands, that paper, plastic money, it's got no intrinsic value. The only reason it has value today is because the government says it has value. The only reason it has value is because the government passes laws to say, you know, shop owners have to receive that plastic paper for the goods they have on their shelves. And it serves its purpose for now, but one day it's going to fail. One day it's going to collapse. Every currency in this world is going to collapse when it comes to the end times. Okay, all of it's going to collapse. And, uh, you know, we don't even have the, at least, at least the plastic paper money, at least it has the value of the plastic in it, or the paper in it, right? But today we just use our credit cards. It's all just digital. It's all just somewhere on a computer. It's got even less value, all right? All it takes is for, you know, all the, the computers to collapse, the internet to collapse, all these, you know, Wi-Fi and all the devices to collapse. There goes your bank account. All it takes is for someone to go to a bank, put zero on your bank balance, and there goes your bank account. <laughs> I mean, it's got, really, there's no value in these things. You know, we shouldn't put our hearts and our, our trust on these things. But Matthew 6, please. Matthew 6, verse 31. Oh, sorry, I should have just read another. Well, stay there. I'll just read to you from uh, Genesis 47, verse 16. It says, And Joseph said, Give your cattle, and I will give you your cattle if money fail. So what's the next thing that happens? When money fails, when it goes to zero, right? The next thing you, you want to do is you go to a barter system, right? You go to, to bartering. That's where you exchange, not, not finances, but you exchange one goods or service for another goods and service, right? If you're a mechanic and I'm an electrician, you know, you have some electrical problem in your house, I'll say, well, I'll fix that problem as long as you can fix my car next time it breaks down. That would be a barter system. We're exchanging, you know, either services or goods one for another. And so they've run out of money. Their money has failed. And all they've got left is their cattle. All they've got left are their, their assets. And, they, and they, they go to Joseph and say, well, let's, I want to give you my assets for the food. Verse number 17. And they brought their cattle unto Joseph. And Joseph gave them bread in exchange for horses and for the flocks and for the cattle of the herds and for the asses. And he fed them with bread for all their cattle for that year. So for a whole year, another year of the famine. I mean, it's seven years long. For just one year, they sell off all their assets just to have food, right? You sell off your, your, you know, your, your um, investment houses that you have. You know, you sell off, you know, the, maybe the gold and the silver and, and the things that you've set aside for, for a tough time. You know, you sell off all the other things that have value in your life. You know, you might sell off your second car or even your first car just to have food. And this is, this is, the, this is the pattern. This is the process. When you run out of money, the next thing you want, because you want to feed yourself and your family, is to sell off your assets. And so Joseph is receiving all these things in exchange for money. Now listen, Joseph is a godly man. He's a righteous man, right? He's a believer. God has put him in this position for that purpose. But what if it's not Joseph? What if it's a wicked man? What if it's the Antichrist? I mean, look how much power Joseph is getting. He's getting all the money all the assets on the land of Egypt. Isn't this what the Antichrist wants? Isn't this what the wicked one wants? But do you think he's going to be kind like Joseph? Of course not, okay? I mean, the, the wicked one to come, the Antichrist, the beast, you know, he's seeking to destroy the world and specifically seeking to destroy the believers. But look at Matthew 6, verse 31. Matthew 6, verse 31. Jesus says these words, Therefore take no thought, saying, what shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or whither or shall we, whither withal shall we be clothed? For after all these things do the Gentiles seek. For your heavenly Father knoweth that ye have need of these things. Listen, brethren, if we are the last generation going through that last those end times, the Father knows what we need. Okay, He knows we need food. He knows we need clothing. You will never, as a child of God, go without food and clothing. This is why we have these stories in Genesis. Remember, Genesis is a book, a foundational book for many doctrines. Well, here we have a foundational story of how God provides the needs even when you're struggling in a time of famine. God will make sure you're provided for. But what you need to do, brethren, is the job that God has left you to do, right? To serve Him, to preach the gospel. You just do what you know God wants you to do. And He'll make sure your needs are covered. 
right? Verse number 33. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Should we be afraid, brethren, of going hungry, going without? No. And if we go through a time when we're hungry and we're going without, and we're doing everything God wants us to do, then just rest in the thought that this is something God wants you to go through. This is a difficulty God wants you to go through for your profit, for your benefit. Okay? But God's not going to allow your children to go hungry. And we need to learn to be content with what? The food and the raiment. How would you feel, brethren, if you lost your house, you lost your cars, you lost your jobs, you lost it all, and all you had left was food and clothing? How would you feel? Well, according to the Bible, you should be happy. <laughs> okay? You should be content with what God has given you. The Bible says in 1 Timothy 6.6, 6, But godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, it is certain we, carry enough, we can carry nothing out. And having food and raiment, let us be therewith content. Are you happy with the food you had this morning? Or the raiment you put on? Oh, but my, my tie didn't match my shirt. Be happy with the tie that you've got. Brother Jason's happy with his purple tie. I'm happy for him. All right? <laughs> we're going to have morning tea. Be content with the morning tea that we're going to share together. Be content with God. God has given you. And God has given you more than that, hasn't he? So much more. But the Bible, you know, God makes it very clear we ought to be content with the food and raiment. Back to Genesis 47. Genesis 47, verse 18. The ungodly, though, they're begging for food. Verse 18. Verse 18. You know, I, I don't believe, if, again, if we're at the last generation in, the, in those end times, I don't believe we're going to go hungry. If we lose our jobs, we lose our houses, we lose everything, God's just going to supernaturally provide. God's just going to have a Joseph out there somewhere. You know, we will have plenty of Josephs out there throughout the world to make sure the people of God are taken care of. Verse number 18. When, the, when that year was ended, they came unto him the second year and said unto him, We will not hide it from my Lord how that our money is spent. My Lord also have our herds and herds of cattle. There is, aught, uh, there is not aught left in thy sight of my Lord but our bodies and our lands. All we've got left is ourselves and the lands we live on, right? Wherefore, Shall we die before thine eyes, both we and our land, by us? They're so hungry, they're saying, look, we'll go into servitude. Can you purchase us? Can you buy us, our lives, our bodies? Buy us and our land for bread. And we and our land will be servants unto Pharaoh. And give us seed that we may live and not die, that the land be not desolate. And Joseph bought all the land of Egypt for Pharaoh. For the Egyptians sold every man his field because the famine prevailed over them. So the land became Pharaoh's. You know, again, you know, Pharaoh's a decent guy here, right? He's working alongside with Joseph. But just think, what if this is the beast? What if this is the Antichrist? You know, when we look at these wars, the famines, these world wars that we've gone through, future wars to come, you want to know, the, the reason behind all these all you need to look at is who's profiting from it that's it who's making money from this war well they're the ones that started it okay and well now look pharaoh he's he's going with what the conditions right it's god that brought the famines in the land right but we see in this time of hardship how people can benefit from it pharaoh is benefiting from it because of joseph right I mean, everyone on this land is benefiting because of Joseph. Otherwise, they would have died of famine. They would have died from hunger. They would have died from starvation. But how desperate can people get where they say, look, just we'll sell ourselves. Can you buy us? Can we be your servants? Right? Keep your finger there and go to Revelation 6, please. Revelation chapter 6. Revelation chapter 6, verse 1. So the next phase was to sell their land and sell themselves. And Revelation 6, 1, it says here, And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw and behold a white horse. 
This is, a, this is the Antichrist here riding on this white horse. And he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him. Look at this. And he went forth conquering and to conquer. Conquering and to conquer. That's what the Antichrist wants to do. He wants to conquer the nations. Hey, Pharaoh was able to conquer all of the lands of Egypt. He was able to take it all for himself. Away, the private property was gone. It all belonged to Pharaoh. Okay? So we see this parallel being played out in the last days where the Antichrist takes full advantage of the people, of the hardships that are going on in the land. Back to Genesis 47 verse 21. And as for the people, he removed them to cities from one end of the borders of Egypt even to the other end thereof. So instead of living on their land, instead of being spread out, all the people of the land are now being put together into big cities, right? That's why I got out of Sydney. No, I'm just <laughs> From one end of the borders of Egypt, even to the other end thereof. Verse 22, Only the land of the priests bought he not, for the priests had a portion assigned them of Pharaoh, and did eat their portion which Pharaoh gave them, wherefore they sold not their lands. So the priests had this personal arrangement with Pharaoh. Obviously these priests are the priests of Egypt. They're not priests of the Lord. All right, so Pharaoh, again, is, not an, un, is an ungodly man, but he made sure that his false priests were uh, taken care of. Verse number 23. Then Joseph said unto the people, Behold, I have bought you this day and your land for Pharaoh. Lo, here is seed for you, that ye may sow the land. Now Joseph then gives them advice how to spend this money. Verse number 24. And it shall come to pass in the increase that you shall give the fifth part unto Pharaoh. So there's, there's the tax, it's 20% tax. A fifth part of what you, what you grow from this seed has to be given to Pharaoh. And he goes, and four parts shall be your own. And now, I'm not sure if I'm reading too much into this, but it seems to break down how these four parts ought to be divided. And I think, I think Joseph has just given them good advice, right? He says, number one, for seed of the field. So save one portion to make sure you can plant more seed in the future, all right? And then it says the next portion, and for your food. So take one portion, 20% of it, and make sure you feed yourself. And then it says, and for them of your household. So another portion for your servants, the people that are in your house, and for food for your little ones. Don't forget your children. Don't forget your little children. Another portion for the future generations to come. I think, I think Joseph is just making sure he's giving them good advice. Divide your portions up. Make sure everyone is provided for. So you're not, you know, you're not just, you know, just looking out for number one. You're, just, you're not just looking out for yourself, but you're also concerned for the future to come. Make sure you have enough seed to plant in the future. So Joseph seems to be giving them sort of financial advice, if, as it were, right? Verse number 25. And they said, Thou hast saved our lives. Let us find grace in the sight of my Lord, and we will be Pharaoh's servants. And Joseph made it a law of the land of Egypt unto this day that Pharaoh should have the fifth part, except the land of the priests only, which became not Pharaoh's. Now, the parallel that I see here, brethren, is that these, these Egyptians are making themselves servants unto Pharaoh. All right? And what we see play out in the end times is that the people will ultimately make themselves servants unto the Antichrist, unto the beast, right? I mean, the money has failed them, right? And what we learn about the end times is that, is that the, um, the beast, the Antichrist, creates a new financial system. You know, what we know as the mark of the beast. And I'll just read it to you in Revelation 13, 16. It says, speaking of the Antichrist, And he causeth all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads that no man might buy or sell, save he had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. So we see this pattern, how nations collapse, how finances collapse, right? And this is going to be the purpose of the devil, the purpose of the Antichrist, to get the people of this world dependent 100% on him. And he's going to bring in this new system, the mark of the beast, you can only buy and sell if you have this mark. You know, and it's, it's tied in with worshipping the beast. It's tied in with worshipping the devil. And the dispensations will say, well, hold on. What about us? You know, if we're going through the tribulation, if, if what you're teaching is true, aren't we going to be hungry? Aren't we going to be, you know, des you know desiring to worship the, the beast, to take the mark so we can, you know, feed ourselves? 
hey, that's not the pattern we see in the Bible. The pattern we see in the Bible is that God would not allow His people to do such things. In fact, if you did such thing, the Bible says that your part will be taken out of the book of life. And we know we can never lose our salvation. We know that we're once saved, we're always saved. Which means when it comes to these times, if we're that last generation, God will provide for us. He's going to make a way that we're going to be able to provide for ourselves. He's going to have those Josephs, as I mentioned. So we shouldn't be afraid of the Antichrist. We shouldn't be afraid. Well, what if we're made to take the mark of the beast? It's not going to happen. Okay, the Bible, you never read in the Bible believers taking the mark of the beast. Okay, it's, it's not there. And people come up with stupid teachings. Oh, but you know, if you take the mark as a believer, if you chop off your hand, you can still be saved. You know, if you take it on your forehead, you top, chop off your head, and that's how you're going to be saved. Stupidity. I mean, I don't know how people listen to these preachers. You know, we, we build your doctrines, build the things you believe on what the Bible says. Know what the Bible doesn't say. And what does the Bible say? When his people are going through famine, he's going to provide. That's what the Bible says. And that's the pattern throughout the Bible. So you're going to be provided for. Don't just start making up doctrines where Christians are taking the mark of the beast. It's stupid. Genesis 47. I'm almost done now. Verse number 27. And Israel dwelt in the land of Egypt, in the land of Goshen, and they had possessions therein and grew and multiplied exceedingly. So look, they're not just surviving, they're doing really well. They're multiplying exceedingly, they're growing. Verse number 28, And Jacob lived in the land of Egypt 17 years, so the whole age of Jacob was 140 and 7 years. And the time drew near, nigh that Israel must die. And he called his son Joseph and said unto him, If now I have found grace in thy sight, put, put I pray thee, thy hand under my thigh, and deal kindly, and truly with me, bury me not, I pray thee, in Egypt. Joseph says, I don't want to be buried in Egypt. He knows he's about to die, okay? And you say, well, why is that important? Why does it matter where you're buried? Well, it doesn't really matter where you're buried, okay? But again, we learn doctrines from the Bible, right? What does Egypt represent? The world, okay? What, what, uh, what Jacob wants, he, he doesn't want to stay in this world forever, He's looking for something else. We, we know that, right? And uh, we actually get a better understanding of this. If you guys can go to, um, go to Genesis 50, please. Go to Genesis 50. We get a better understanding why Jacob did not want to stay in the land of Egypt when we read about Joseph, because Joseph didn't want to stay in the land of Egypt either, even as a dead person, right? In Genesis 50, verse 25, it says, Genesis 50, verse 25, and Joseph took an oath of the children of Israel, saying, God will surely visit you, and ye shall carry up my bones from hence. What Joseph is saying is, God's going to come at a point, and He's going to deliver you out of Egypt. And I want you to carry my bones with you when you go. Say, why? Why did Joseph want that? Uh, yeah, why did Joseph want that? Well, Hebrews 11.22 gives us the answer. It says, by faith, Joseph, when he died made mention of the departing of the children of Israel and gave commandment concerning his bones. He said, listen, take my bones with you. I don't want them staying in Egypt because of faith. He had faith that God would deliver the Israelites out of Egypt one day. He's going to take him out of that place. That's where his faith was. And so by knowing what Joseph was hoping for, now we have a better understanding why J Jacob wanted the same things. He said, don't bury me here. You know, take my bones with you, bury me in the land of Canaan. And brethren, as I said, we're just sojourners. We're just passing in this land. And uh, look, at verse number, look at verse number 30, Genesis 40, verse 30. He says, But I will lie with my fathers, and thou shalt carry me out of Egypt, and bury me in their burying place. And he said, I will do as thou hast said. And he said, Swear unto me, and he swear unto him, and Israel bowed himself upon the bed's head. All right. So please go to 1 Corinthians now, 15. 1 Corinthians 15. As I said, I've seen just these parallels about the end times here. You know, parallels of tribulation. Parallels of how the Antichrist would take advantage of the destruction in this world. You know, parallels how God will provide for his people. And I think we have a final parallel here is that, you know, their bones, their bodies would not be left in Egypt. Their bodies would not be left 
on this earth. They wanted to be taken away from there because of faith. They had faith that God will physically deliver them out of that place. And brethren, we have the same faith. We have the same hope. We have the same desire. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 51. 1 Corinthians 15 51. The Bible says, Behold, I show you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, for the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. For this corruptible must put on incorruption, and this mortal must put on immortality. Brethren, I, see, I, I believe what, the, what we're seeing here with the desire for their bones to be not left in Egypt is a picture of the rapture. That our physical bodies will not be left on this earth. Again, this is not our home. You know, yes, we're saved. Our souls, our spirits will be with God when we die. But whatever's left, you know, our bones, whatever dust remains of us on this earth, if we're here for, for very long, whatever's rotted away on this earth, God's going to take that corruptible thing and make it incorruptible. God's going to take that mortal thing and make it immortal. God's going to give us new resurrected bodies. And those bodies are going to get out of here. You know, this earth is not our home. That heaven, the new heavens, the new earth, that new Jerusalem, that new city, that heavenly city, that's our home. That's our dwelling place. And so, brethren, the same thing's going to happen to us. We have faith not just in the salvation that God gives us, not just the salvation of the soul, but the salvation of the flesh. God's going to come back, give us those resurrected bodies one day, and we too are going to be taken out of the land of Egypt. All right, let's pray.